your outcome through the eyes of elite performers. Well, good morning. Thank you guys for having us. Um, for me, this is kind of a nice opportunity to come back to Whistler. Last time I was here was in 2010 for the Winter Olympics. Uh, and actually, I'm looking forward to hopefully the latest afternoon going back to where our US Biathlon was housed, uh, just down the hill a little bit. So um, thank you all for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to get us started, uh, we're going to talk about four areas of professional development that through our careers in sport, as athletes, as coaches, we both coached, my career in sports psychology and executive coaching, we've identified four key areas, uh, those being preparation, adversity, transition, and owning your outcome. Uh, and as we go through those, we'll talk about our experiences, of course, but hopefully we'll be able to relate them to some of your experiences, and we encourage you to talk with us so it's more of a discussion, not just us talking at you. The first is developing a preparation and a foundation. Um, and some of the fundamental or foundation skills that we've identified, there are five. Uh, first being your beliefs and morals and values. And hopefully, you know, as you all remember growing up, you develop your beliefs and your morals and values at home. You know, through your interactions with your family, your friends, your relationships. As early as, you know, your, some of your early memories, you may recall some of those relationships uh, and how they helped you identify who you are as a person. You know, maybe the difference is you, how you look at men and women, or boys and girls at a young age, uh, what relationships look like to you and how they are established, how you learn how to communicate, both verbally and non-verbally. Those can help you establish some of those <coughs> beliefs that you have about yourself as well as others. In addition, as you grow through your youth, adolescence, getting into high school and early college years, Hopefully you start developing life skills. Some of those skills of now learning how to effectively communicate, not just communicate, but are you really an effective listener? Are you able to effectively articulate what you want to say in the moment? How do you manage your own emotions? You know, do you let your thoughts and emotions cloud your judgment? Or can you work through those with effective life skills that you've developed? Are you able to discern or, or develop certain skills of discipline. You know, how that discipline plays into your ability maybe to develop time management skills and how that will play into not only your college career but hopefully your professional career. One of the things that, you know, as I went through high school and college, I was, had some early success and before I graduated high school, I won five national titles in track and field as a junior Olympics. And I went into high school, um, it was just announced, I, I set a state record in 100 meter high hurdles. It's about almost 32 years old now. Um, so I went into college at UCLA, and I was expected to be as good, if not better, going into college. And I was the only athlete coming in as, as a full ride scholarship athlete. And I was entering a team, though, that had just won nationals, into two championships, and they had not only Olympic, Olympians on the team, but numerous Olympic gold medalists on the team. So walking into that environment was a bit daunting. So I had to rely on some of those early developmental skills that I had, I thought, developed as a high school athlete. But once I got to UCLA, I had the opportunity to become more familiar with John Wooden and his practices. John Wooden is the famous Hall of Fame coach in basketball at UCLA. Um, and so I started understanding more about his pyramid of success that we'll get into a little bit later. One of the areas of preparation that we find important, and then that was definitely important for me throughout my career, was having a really strong support network. For me, those, those people included my family, my friends, my coaches, uh, my teachers, and they really helped me to create a stable foundation and help me guide, help guide me through all the years of triumphs and all the tribulations that I would inevitably go through as a track and field athlete. My mother, for instance, knew that I was extremely shy. I know I'm standing up here in front of you, but when I was an 11 or 12 year old girl just starting out in track and field, I could barely get two words out of my mouth. And even though I was 
extremely athletic. People just assumed that meant I was confident and you know, able to be out in front of other athletes and the coaches, but the truth is I was not. And so had it not been for my mother's willingness to literally sit every single day with me at practice in the stands off to the side so I could go like this and see her sitting there, I would never have been able to have any sort of career as an athlete because I wasn't strong enough at that time to do that on my own. But she saw that I had talent and she was willing to be that support system for me until I was able to stand up on my own two feet. Now as a parent, because I've had that experience, I realize how important that is. So I want to get to as many games as I can. And I want to be there so that when the kids look over, they see Ross and myself standing there knowing that they have us to support them no matter whether they're successful or they're going through a difficult time. Um, and really at the end of the day when you are successful or if you have had a challenging time, it doesn't mean as much to you if you don't have people to share that with. Um, the next point for us that we find important is competence creates confidence. And by that I mean the repetition of any particular skill is the thing that gives you confidence in your ability to execute that skill. I've heard it said that it takes 10,000 repetitions of anything to, be, uh, to master that particular skill. I'm pretty sure I jumped way more than 10,000 jumps in my career, but I certainly put that amount of work in. Um, and there's nothing quite like that to give you that feeling when you walk out on a stage with the best athletes in the world to feel that, hey, I'm supposed to be here too. Have you ever seen that in an athlete? Has anyone here ever noticed, maybe you're watching TV and you're watching a football game or, I don't know, basketball game, and you see an athlete walk out on the court and you can tell without them opening their mouth that they feel confident about themselves? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. I always look at the tennis player Serena Williams. I've heard it said numerous times that she wins matches before she even plays the first point because of the way she walks out onto the court. Everyone's intimidated. They know she's put in hard work. She knows she's put in hard work. Um, and she exudes that type of confidence and power and strength. And in that moment, many, many times, she's won that match before she even steps up to the line. And it's because she's put in the work. Um, and there's nothing that can replace that. The last thing is work ethic. Work ethic is something a lot of times people can't teach you that, you know, you're born with that. You can improve it, but a lot of times it's innate and true work ethic is seen when nobody's watching you. Your boss isn't watching you, your coach isn't watching you, your teammates aren't watching you. You're not getting credit for this stuff. You just know that in order for me to improve, I need to do this extra stuff on my own. And the willingness to do that and to not find excuses like, oh, it's raining outside. I, this is a perfectly good excuse not to go to track practice today and still go. That is when you're showing not only to yourself, but those around you that you are willing to put in that hard work. And then no one can take away from you when you reap the success of your efforts. And one little tidbit to add to the Serena Williams story. I had an opportunity when I was in Chula Vista at the Olympic Training Center to work with not only U.S. athletes, but also international athletes. And so I received a call from the Women's Tennis Association to work with a foreign athlete who just happened to live in the San Diego area. And one of her main issues was she was very competitive, um, was competing against Serena Williams. She said she would come to matches and if she saw she was matched against Serena, she already automatically just felt this sunken feeling because the person I was working with was about 5'4", maybe 130 pounds. So very slight, small, but very quick, um, but not quite as powerful, not as dominating. And one of the things she said when she would line up and she, she would see Serena across the, the net, she said, she, I felt so small. I felt like a little person playing against someone who was not only much larger in stature, but also had this support in this background uh, and confidence about her. Uh, so one of the things that 
we talked about that came out of our work together was how she could feel big and how she could, in her own mind, create a championship mindset. So one of the things we have identified in your preparation is how do you create, how do you create your own successful mindset? And in my executive coaching, one of the things we talk about is DAC. DAC is direction, alignment, and commitment. And so, and I encourage you guys to think about in your work, maybe as principles, what direction are you creating? What vision are you creating for your dealerships? Is it clear, not only to you, but to everyone that you're working with? Is it something that's written? Is it something that's spoken? Is it something that's exhibited? Maybe on boards, whiteboards, you know, do we paperwork that you distribute? But is there a clear direction and vision? And with that, is there alignment? So does everyone in the dealership understand? And be, are they all aware of that same vision? From all your managers, all your sales reps, to administration, every area of the dealerships, are they in alignment with that direction? And if so, you're likely going to have their commitment. If not, there's room to grow. Right? And that's where you start identifying where's our maybe alignment off? In what ways can we help realign? And one way to do that is looking at your goal setting. So in sport, we often, at the beginning of the season, we set goals. I go into universities and they're all excited. Hey, we got a sports psychologist, help us set goals. And they're all excited, they're at tables like this, and we'll do breakout groups, and we'll give them papers, and they'll fill them out. And I come back a month later and say, hey, remember we set those goals? Where are they? All the athletes do this. Oh, man, I don't know, Where do I, where's my backpack? You know, I don't know. No one can find them because they set goals at the beginning of the year, but they forget about them because there's no follow through. One of the things we talk about quite a bit in sport is setting process goals. So once you have the outcome goal already established, do you have process goals? One of the things we know in psychology research is our motivation lasts about, let me ask you, how long do you think motivation to achieve a goal lasts? Less than what? Less than 30 days. Less than 30 days. Good. Anyone else? A week. About a week, okay. 30 minutes. <laughs> 30 minutes, you must have children. <laughs> so in research we know motivation to achieve a goal lasts about 15 days, right? So process goals are important to be set about every two weeks. So about every two weeks you should be checking in with folks in your dealerships to figure out are we still aligned? Are we still working in the same direction? Or have you lost focus? You're off doing something else now. We're folks maybe on, we're, we, want to get a, we want to get sales of our $75,000 car. You're folks on selling a $35,000 car. Right, so is there a clear alignment? Does everyone in the dealership know how to sell a $75,000 car? Because it's a lot easier, I imagine, to sell a $35,000 car. Yeah, it looks good, it's pretty, it has all the simple bells and whistles. Let's get that off the block, right? If the, for example, the objective is to sell 300 cars this month. Does everyone in the dealership know that? And if not, why not? Are they off on their own track doing something different because there's not clear alignment? So look at how you can create DAC. Um, and you can do that through setting process goals. Every two weeks checking in with everyone to make sure there is a clear objective. The other part we know for sure in sport is and through research help to help folks um, maintain their motivation is helping them find intrinsic sources of motivation as opposed to extrinsic sources of motivation. In sport, a lot of times, what's televised is the outcome, right? So you'll see the Olympics on NBC, or maybe you'll see a World Championships or a U.S. Open, a World Cup, but it's always the outcome. So you see them get the flashy prize at the end, but you don't see the process that they go through to get there. Particularly in Olympic sports, our process is four years. So often coaches want to know in that first year, is this someone that I want to spend time with for the next three and a half, maybe four years to get to the Olympic opportunity? And to do that, we're looking at intrinsic sources of motivation. Is this someone who's going to be motivated on the rainy day of training, when it's cold outside, when it's wet, when their back's hurting, when their legs are sore, when something's happening in their personal life that is going to affect them, will they still come to practice? Will they still dedicate themselves to training? And if they have that intrinsic source of motivation that's going to drive them, more likely they will. But if they're chasing that goal of money or a medal or someone celebrating and cheering for them, once those things are not there, they're probably not going to come to practice. 
So as in, in psychology and for coaches, we want to find those individuals who have that intrinsic source of motivation, something that's going to pull them to work every day, not just on championship days. Another component is deliberate training. Deliberate training is not something where you just sort of clock in and clock out just to check a box like, oh, I was there for my eight hours or I was at the track for my five hours, so I did work. No, it's purposeful. There's a goal, there's an insight, there's something you're actually trying to accomplish on that day, and it's not just something to pass time. Um, if you wanna be good at something, you actually have to focus your attention on that something. I started out in high school as a high jumper. I grew up, I grew to be very tall. I was five, seven, five, eight by the time I was 12, so I was taller than all the boys. And so everyone thought I would be a high jumper and that I would continue to get taller, but turns out that was it. I stopped at five, eight. Um, <laughs> I even tried the shot put. Um, they thought, well, she has the muscles, let's try her in that event. Turns out, I, once I tried sprinting and long jumping, that was where we were realizing my talents lied. And so that's where I focused my energies. And then once I got to college, turns out I was actually just an average sprinter, but a really good long jumper. The talent pool had increased, just uh, there were more people for me to compete against. And I realized if I wanted to be really good at something, again, I needed to focus my t attention in even more so. Um, there was a lot of ups and downs to come my way, but even with that, it, I realized that long jumping was where I was gonna find my future. And I focused my attention there. I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. A lot of people do that. They're busy spinning wheels like, oh, you try to call them, they're not available because they're busy. I don't know what they're doing, but there's nothing to show for that. So if you're gonna spend the time and be busy, make sure it is focused and purposeful and that you're actually gonna accomplish a goal. Um, the last point of creating a successful mindset is the ability to have delayed gratification. That is not always easy because especially in the, this day and age with electronics and the easy accessibility of everything, people want results like right now, yesterday, you know, before they even put in work. And for sure with the Olympics, as Ross mentioned, it's every four years. So what are you doing in these four years in between? It's, you can't just sit around and wait and only train in that fourth year. That's not how it works. And people would ask me all the time, how do you stay motivated for something that's so far away? And the way I was able to do that was to set short-term goals for myself. If I was to only think, okay, four years down the road, I need to be at this level of fitness, I would never get there. The way I was able to do that, I would set small goals that I could accomplish every day, every week. And once I could see myself improving incrementally, I would be like, okay, I got that. I can do the next thing. I can do the next thing. And before you know it, a year would have passed, be on to the second year, and gradually putting in the stepping stones uh, in order to reach that long-term goal. My coach would often say that we were depositing checks into the bank and we would cash them out in four years. That's sort of the mindset that I had. Our next development step is moving through adversity. Uh, and so I, I mentioned, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to enter UCLA in a full scholarship, uh, track and field scholarship. Uh, so I had big expectations coming into school. Unfortunately, I didn't know what I thought were shin splints in high school, where I was able to sit out a month and still come back and you know, win state, and set state records were actually stress fractures. So I went into college with stress fractures. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can figure it out. I'll get through training the same way I did in high school. So I, I was actually jogging. I was doing warm-up like this. So a lot of people on the track later thought, oh, I thought each side would be cool. I was like, hey, no, that, that actually hurt. Uh, I actually had fractures in my shin. So my for into my first year, I went through this whole holistic therapy treatment. Um, it didn't work. So I had to have a, a surgery. So they put a titanium rod inside my right tibia from my knee to my ankle. And the doctor said, you know, we've never done this on a track and field athlete. We've done this on one athlete prior to you, it was Dana Stubblefield, big lineman. 
you know, maybe went 10 yards at that time in NFL, went 10 yards out down the field and back. So we don't know what's going, going to be the outcome for a hurdler who's, you know, if you're on track for more than 14 seconds, it's a slow day and, you know, you're pounding. You know, you're coming off a hurdle, you're stepping down pretty hard on that, for me, my lead leg. So they told my coaches, you know, it's, you know, this age, you know, it, I wasn't even this big, I was smaller then. <laughs> um, it's probably not going to work out for him. His career is probably over. Uh, so my coach said, you know, Ross, we love you. You're a good student, but we're going to take that scholarship. We're going to get you on, on a half ride scholarship. Um, we'll pay for blows and tuition. Um, so of course I was destroyed. At that point in my life, uh, I was a good student, but honestly, I was more of an athlete student as opposed to a student athlete. Because uh, my ex expectations, like Jackie's, I, I was expecting, I was getting into the best program at that time in the country, I would, had dreams of going to the Olympics. So I had to put that to the side. Uh, fortunately, I was in the field of psychology, so I was learning more about the mind and body and how to coordinate them. Uh, I had the good fortune of having a sports psychologist on campus, who today is still one of my dear friends and mentors, Dr. Bill Parham. And I learned more about how I could start really working on my own successful mindset so I could get through that point of adversity and come back. And as I did, um, come back and end up winning Pac-10 titles and becoming All-American at UCLA. New talent meets existing talent. So what does that mean? Well, for me, I was the, similar to, I guess, how you were, number one high school long jump recruit. That includes all of the Caribbean and the United States, even though I grew up in the I grew up in the Bahamas. So I was recruited from the Caribbean to go to Stanford University. And when I got there, I had never lost a race in high school. I had never lost a long jump competition. So even though I was still shy, I was fairly confident about my athletic abilities. Um, but on day one, my coach, who you'll hear me talk about regularly, his name is Brooks Johnson, told me very clearly that I was no longer the big fish in the little pond and that I was a teeny tiny fish in a very big pond and just let that set in, get over yourself. And I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> um, a bit of a rude awakening. I was a young freshman. I had just turned 17, far away from home. So I realized I was going to be in for some for a different experience from what I was accustomed to at home. Uh, took me a little adjust, it took a little time for me to adjust to that, but I actually had to accept that that's who I now was, and I actually had to be okay with that. Unfortunately for me, uh, one of the immediate uh, tribulations that I encountered my freshman year in college was that I thought, well, I'm really good in school, I'm really good at track, let me be really good at putting on weight. <laughs> So I did that very quickly. I put on 25 pounds within the first three, three and a half months in college. And if you know anything about sports and long jumping in particular, the physics, that does not work. <laughs> My coach would tell me every day that fat does not fly. <laughs> he told me that every day. And it didn't. Um, <laughs> I ended up having two knee surgeries. I never really got if someone else was to have looked at me, they would have thought I was still pretty fit. I think the highest my body fat percentage went up to was 13%, but I was usually around 9 or 10%, but it was a mixture of fat and muscle and everything in between, and it really just did not work. Um, I blamed everybody for this weight gain. I, I blamed the dryer. I said the dryer shrunk my clothes. I blamed the strength coach for having me lift too much weight. I blamed the nutritionist for not giving me a good program. And I just continued to do that for two years. And suffice to say, my performances stagnated. I never even jumped the distances I had done in college, in high school, my first two years of college. Didn't qualify for NCAA championships, nothing. Just was walking around, eating dorm food, and <laughs> being content to just be a, a participant on the track team. Um, one meet, he, uh, my coach, we were actually at the University of Washington indoors, it was freshman year, 
and another poor result. And he literally walked up to me in the sand where all the officials were and grabbed my hand and yanked me out of the pit and screamed at me that if I ate another slice of pizza, he would make me walk home from Washington. <laughs> so <laughs> that was not a good day for me. Um, and it literally took me finally looking in the mirror one day and taking accountability for where I had ended up for me to take it into my own hands to try and do something about it. Um, it also helped that Brooks gave me an ultimatum that if I didn't lose the weight over the summer of my sophomore year that he was not going to let me back on the team. So that sort of helped. And I did that. I finally managed over that summer to lose the 25 pounds and came back at the beginning of uh, my junior year, starting a whole new trajectory for my athletic career. So some, some things are within our control as we deal with adversity, some things are not. Uh, I think as you take account of your experiences, you look at what's within your control to manage and to figure out how to work through. When I started working with the U.S. Olympic Committee, I already spent seven years at the University of California, Davis, uh, designing and directing my own applied sports psychology program. So when I got to the U.S. Olympic Committee, I figured, okay, I feel pretty good about you know, my job and what I can do and how to do it. I'd applied it to you know, 26 different sports at UC Davis and all the coaches and athletes there. I figured coming into the Olympic Committee, I know sport, I can figure it out. Well, when I took the position, I was focused mainly on summer sports. That's what I knew. So I was working with track and field, canoe kayak, rowing. I knew those sports. Um, canoe kayak, not so well, but I knew it was in a boat. It was on the water. I could figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> However, U.S. Biathlon, I had no clue what that was, honestly. And I thought maybe running and cycling, maybe a little swimming and cycling. I, I really didn't know. I didn't know it was a winter sport. And so when I said, you know, Ross, you're going to spend a lot of time in Germany, Norway, you know, Finland, you're going to be going places for biathlon. I was like, man, that's different. I didn't know summer sports. I didn't know they did that up there. And I, no, 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 Ross, these are winter sports. So you're going to be in cold weather in, in October through March. And I was like, oh, okay, you, have, you guys have gear for that, right? Because I, I, I don't do cold weather. <laughs> So anyway, I, we, one of my first experiences at a U.S. biathlon competition was in RuPaul, Germany. We're up on top of the mountain, it's freezing to me, probably like 12 degrees, and we're walking into, and for this, their World Cups, they're like our Super Bowls, but they have them, they have, I think, eight or nine in a season. And so the competition starts at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's thousands of people already out at this site, they're tailgating hard. I mean, they've got their horns, they're blowing their horns, they're playing the accordion, they're going at it, 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, and you all know tailgating, most of them are not very clear-minded already at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. So we're walking into the venue, and I'm walking in with, at that time we had a German coach, um, a Swedish coach, and a German ski technician, and my supervisor to the US Olympic Committee. And so we're all walking in, and we hear a voice from the distance, Dr. Flowers, Dr. Flowers. Like, nah, we're RuPaul in Germany, I don't know anyone. So we just keep walking. Voice gets closer and closer. Finally, my supervisor says, Yo, Ross, I think this person right here is saying your name. I think he knows you. <laughs> I said, you know, I don't, I don't know anyone here. And so realize after the conversation that someone I communicated with through email uh, about biathlon and sports psychology, so we're talking for a while. But before, before we finish, my supervisor, JT, looks at him and says, hey, you know, we're almost 10,000 people in a venue in Rue Polding, Germany. How did you know this was Dr. Flowers? He said, oh, easy. Only black men at, US at, US at a biathlon competition in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I stood out in this, in this venue. Um, so part of my working through that adversity was, one, getting through the cultural barrier, um, but also understanding the sport and knowing that I could apply what I'd been trained in, my own skill sets, my knowledge of sports psychology, learning how to apply it to a new environment. The third area of professional development is transition. How do you move on after adversity? Uh, one of the first main steps to moving on and transitioning is accepting who you are, 
where you are and knowing where you're trying to go. And it brings us to, brings me to a few questions that I would always pose to myself. Some of those included, who am I? What do I want? What motivates me? And a lot of times the answers to these questions as I was going along helped me figure out why I was continuing to do this thing that at some points just brought me to my knees. But then on other days were the best days I've ever, ever had. And when times got hard and training got hard and results, results weren't as good as I wanted them to be, I had to remind myself of what I was, what was the real reason I was in it for. And aside from making my family proud and having their support, I had to think about, is, do I want fame? Do I want money? Am I trying to be great at this, at something? Um, and I realized at the end of the day, uh, my barometer for success was simply if I did everything that I could and if I worked as hard as I could and if I didn't cut any corners, how good could I really be in track and field and how far could I really go? Great thing about track is it's very quantifiable. I don't have to wonder if I'm one of the best uh, jumpers in the world, just people thinking about it. There are actual numbers that can tell me this and distances that tell me that. So it's actually one of the best things I like about the sport of track and field. It's black and white. There's no subjectivity. I don't get style points. I don't have to point my toes or look pretty doing it. I just have to have a good result. And so for me, that was always a good thing. Um, it was also important for me to achieve excellence without PEDs, performance enhancing drugs. People, when they're figuring out their why or how, they have to figure out what you're willing to do to get to that. Um, and for some people, they're okay with doing anything, everything. I was okay with doing everything uh, legally. I had no interest in performance enhancing drugs. That for me meant absolutely nothing. Um, Toni Morrison, the great author and poet that recently passed away, had a great quote that I liked. And she said, if you can only be tall because somebody else is on their knees, then you have a serious problem. And I've always been of the mindset that if the only way for me to be great, if the only way for me to be successful was to cheat or lie or steal or take performance enhancing drugs, then I really wanted no part of it. And my dad's a pastor, so I can assure you he would want no part of that either. And I needed to be able to look at my parents in the face and know that I was being honest and fair. And if I ended up in last place, okay, I could deal with that because at least I gave everything that I had. And to me, there's absolutely no glory in victory if you've cheated. I never understand how these people who you know have taken whatever they've taken, they stand there and they're crying and they're doing all this stuff. And I'm like, but you took, tr like, I don't get it. You take drugs, and to me, it just takes away the whole meaning of the... And it's the same thing in business, I feel. Uh, if you're cheating your way to advance yourself, to me, that's just no success at all. I was actually offered drugs one day. I was standing outside a hotel in Lausanne, Switzerland, minding my own business, and this coach that I knew literally just walked up to me and said, Hey, Jackie, he's from the Ukraine. You want to take some drugs? He's like, you put it here, you put it here, you put it here. He was showing me all, and I was like, what are you, t are we just having this conversation right now? I told him no, no thank you. It was the quickest no I ever said, and I told him if he ever came back up to me with something like that again, I would report him. And he was like, okay, I'm just trying to help you. I'm like, no, you're really not trying to help me. And months later, it was his athletes that were involved in that whole Balco scandal. And I was like, thank you. Jesus and your people that I was not involved in that in that situation. Actually, we, we found out too. So tell them about the games where your best performance in Olympic games, and if they were now to take blood samples from all those athletes, what place? You yeah, I mean, my highest people always ask me. So let me tell you before you ask: Have you ever won a medal? No, I have not. The highest I finished is I actually finished seventh in the. Sydney Olympics, 
But when they went back, I don't know if you guys know the athlete Marion Jones, they took her medal away. She finished third ahead of me, so then I was moved up to sixth. And I would always ask my mom, am I supposed to say sixth or seventh? She's like, I mean, you earned it. Pardon? I did not cheat. However, in addition to them wiping out her results, so I moved up to sixth, the lady that finished fourth, uh, who they then moved up to the bronze medal spot, a couple years later, she got banned for something, and I'm sure she was taking it then. She was taking it two years before, but her result stands, but she was wiped out from another competition. The lady that finished second, also in a competition, a uh, year later also got busted, but her Olympic results still stood, and I just kept saying, man, they just need to keep going back and testing people. <laughs> I'm trying to get a medal. <laughs> so one of my uh, greatest opportunities that I remember was my opportunity to begin working with USA Track and Field back in 2002. Um, I was at that time still a young professional, but Having spent a lot of time as an athlete and coach track and field, I was excited for the opportunity to work with track and field. And I still, at that point, a lot of the athletes who were still competing were athletes I competed with. My coach was an Olympic coach at that time. So I was excited for the opportunity. And a lot of times we get up before the Olympic Games during the, the years of preparation, we give talks just like this to coaches, athletes, even parents who had athletes um, that were Olympic hopefuls. And so my first one, I, and we had at that time, folks who were, had provided sports psychology services to team, Olympic teams in the past, mentoring those of us who were coming in uh, to work with teams in the future. And so before my presentation, I asked one of the folks who were mentoring me, hey, do you have any suggestions what, you know, about how I can present myself to make sure this goes well? And a very stoic look, he just looked me dead in the face and said, in a more descriptive way, just don't mess it up. So I was like, okay, uh, thanks, I guess. But I guess what it helped me realize was he knew I was an athlete. He knew I'd coached. He said, just go do you. You know, you know your business. You know, you, you know what you're good at. And it would help me, what helped reinforce in me was knowing what I know, but also knowing I don't know it all and be willing to ask questions. Uh, so at this point, do you all have any questions about anything we said so far? Okay. What was the best advice that you received from a coach or mentor? Uh, Besides, don't mess it up. <laughs> I think it was later on when I realized I was trying to do so many different things, um, working with different sports, working outside of university, um, doing executive coaching, writing books, trying to do too much. Um, so I had, actually, my mentor, Dr. Bill Parham, told me, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no and just settle down in your area of expertise and be a little more focused. Yes? My 14 year old's here, maybe he can answer that one. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's very hard, you know, particularly because, you know, there's so many distractions, social media being one. Uh, one of the things I've, I've done for my kids, and I, when I talk with some of my clients, I, you know, I, I encourage them not to allow the kids to, to have social media. You know, so no Twitter, no Instagram, no Pinterest, whatever they're into, uh, until they feel they're socially responsible enough to handle them. But I think there's, there's a lot of distractions, as Jackie, we've talked about already, is working on delayed gratification. You know, so are there things you can pay more attention to in the moment um, that can help you build solid skills so you don't need those distractions? So if you're in the car ride, you have to give them something to look at, a tablet or something, or can you have open conversation, dialogue? You know, you know, both of us have spent time on campuses recently, and we walk around, like I walk around UCLA, and it's very hard to find someone who's not plugged in. 
and who can just, who's actually walking with their head up and looking around, <clears throat> seeing their environment. Oftentimes, you'll see them walking, and before they know, oh, boom, I ran into someone or something, and they can't figure out why. It's like, well, they're not paying attention. So we're trying to help people pay attention in the moment. We'll have an opportunity for more questions at the end. Um, that was my little head then, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> threw me off. Um, <laughs> the, one of the things that, in line with a person also being able to say no to people, is having people around you to say no to you. Um, to rely on honest and direct feedback from those people that you work with, those people that you train with. Um, it's important to have those kinds of people in your business and in your careers. You'll find that yes people, they don't make you uncomfortable. They just go along with everything you're saying, whether it's a good idea or a horrible idea. They don't force you outside of your comfort zone. And because of that, they really don't help you to grow. And sometimes you really need to have constructive criticism. You have to be able to stand in that and own up to whether you're not doing the best job that you could, or if there's just some slight thing that you could do to help improve your performance. Um, it takes the ability to not take everything personal, because I'm a very sensitive person, and it took me a while to let not let some of the things that the same coach at Stanford would say to me every day, not let it cause me to cry, literally cry every day, every day, I was just crying, crying, crying. And I had to get to a point where I could take the good of what he was saying to me without making it this whole personal thing that he was trying to attack me. And at the end of the day, it was for my benefit. Um, Ross? So another area that I found through my transition of becoming more professional and feeling confident in my professional identity was learning to be myself. You know, so a lot of times the difference I think of speaking, for example, at a psychology convention is you have to support everything you say with research. Who did it? You know, what year was it published? So you have to speak with this scientific background and more of a PhD mouth. And so when I, so I started calling my PhD mouth, but when I come to athletes and coaches, they look at me like, what are you talking about? Like, why do you think that relates to us? And so learning how to speak more sport, um, or just for me, understanding the environment that I'm in and being able to relate to that environment. And so knowing how to use my background, my training, my knowledge and experiences, but be able to relate it in an understandable way, which is another reason in why I wrote this book, there were questions that parents and coaches were asking me. But to say it in a way that's very understandable and relatable, so it doesn't come across as too scientific. So for me, part of my transition was becoming comfortable with my professional identity and being myself. And a huge part of that for me was also learning how to communicate with folks who are a little more challenging. So a good example of that is when I started working with the LA Clippers, um, they had an idea of what they thought they wanted in sports psychology. Um, they didn't quite know what sports psychology was or how to integrate it. And they had some folks who, um, let's say, were critical of the area because they didn't know much about it. Old, kind of old school coaching philosophies. And so the ability to soften that for them and teach them what a soft skill is, like what it really is effective listening. You know, what really is communicating effectively. How do you spread that direction, alignment, commitment through not only your players and your team, but through the coaching staff and higher administration, so everyone is actually on the same page. You don't have silos of people, right? You don't have silos of administrators, silos of coaches, silos of those who are just player personnel. Um, so developing those communication skills, I found to be very effective uh, in being able to transition and relate to different populations of folks within and outside of sport. The other aspect, um, you know, looking at the differences of working, for example, in university, it's very educational background. You have more time, more of a process of learning and development to go through. We're working with Olympic sports. It's athlete-centered, coach-driven, performance-based. But you know you have a four-year time period. So you're looking at professional development. Where in professional sports and in business, my experiences so far are more outcome-related. You know, they're outcome-focused. So in basketball, professional, professional basketball, 
they're not seeing something pretty quickly, they're starting to ask a lot of questions. What's going on? Why is this not, why is this not happening? Why is this one athlete, no, why are they not improving? After two weeks, you've been here two weeks, this person's not improving, what's wrong? Exactly, I've been here two weeks, you know how psychology works? You know, you're not gonna see a muscle grow in two weeks. Why do you think the brain's gonna expand in two weeks? It's gonna take time. So trying to help, in my experiences, allow more time for education and development and training. So when you do start looking for those results and outcome, you have something to support them. And that goes back to setting process goals. So when you get to, when you're looking for an outcome, you can say, well, hey, have we gone through those processes of progression? For me, owning professional identity really wasn't an issue when I was competing because I ran track. That's what I did for 17 years from the day I graduated Stanford till 2009, 17 years. I had a professional career in track and field, which is a really long time. If you guys don't know how the sport, how sports usually work, that's a fairly long career. Um, but when I retired, I tore my Achilles. That's how my career ended. Um, I was planning to retire the following year anyway, so don't feel so badly for me. Um, <laughs> but because it ended a few months before I had planned to end my career, I didn't exactly have a plan for that day. And I didn't expect people, my friends and family, to introduce me everywhere I went as, oh, this is my friend Jackie Edwards, she's a five-time Olympian. I was like, okay. I do other things. <laughs> um, however, that is who I was. I mean, I had put in all this blood, sweat, and tears to be that person, yet for some reason I was feeling funny about it as if I was being put into this box, but it was a box that I put myself in because I wanted to be that person. And, but in my mind, I was thinking, you know, I played the piano, I'm good in school, I was a bowling champion, all these things I was telling myself. <laughs> Yeah, I was two-time junior national bowling champion. High game, 264, yes. Um, <laughs> I was telling myself all these things for no reason. I'm the same person who's saying, master your trade, but here I was trying to tell myself that I'm all these other things. When, yes, I had accomplished all these other things, but I had put in work to be great at this one thing, and. I don't know if it was just being uncomfortable with other people acknowledging that, because I was okay with it, but I, I don't think I was so comfortable with other people saying it. And I had to sort of accept the fact that that is who I am and be proud of that as, as opposed to sort of pushing it away on the side. And no one gave it to me, I earned it. And, and now I'm thankful for that. And it's a very different uh, presentation of yourself to be proud or grateful for your accomplishments. I'm not talking about walking around being obnoxious or arrogant, that's not what I mean. I mean if you put in hard work and you accomplish something, you get a promotion and you're the boss, feel good about that because you earned it. Um, we're gonna move into the last Yeah, just looking at time. Yep. So, as we've kind of alluded to, owning your outcome is, one of the things I look at in particular is knowing what your strengths are, you know, and I actually tested that this morning on my son to see if he, how he responded to this, but one of the things I do when I first start working uh, with an athlete particularly is I ask them, you know, what are your strengths? And it's always inter interesting to me to hear what someone maybe in middle school will say compared to someone who is either in college or for sure is a professional athlete. Who do you think can answer that question better, the younger individual or the older? Younger. Exactly, the younger. Younger ones tend to rattle them off like this. Well, I'm good at soccer, I'm good at video games, I'm good at math, I can, you know, I make friends really quickly, and they'll just go on and on, they'll talk to you. Because they're not as cluttered as we are as we get older with what people expect of us, what we think we know about ourselves, or wanting to be humble, not wanting to be too arrogant, or if we are arrogant, you know, saying the, the right thing still, what we think people want to hear about us. So one thing that I think is very important is knowing what your strengths are. And if you're not really sure, get a 360 evaluation. Ask folks around you. You know, if you, if you all are principals, 
Ask people around you, what do you think I'm, I'm really good at? Where do my strengths lie? How do my, what are my strengths in communicating? What are my strengths in leadership? What are my strengths in negotiating? What are my strengths in management? And see what kind of feedback you receive. That's one of the experiments you know, I actually encouraged us to do with, when I was with the Clippers was, as a management group, let's get an idea of what the culture really is. Instead of us trying to decide what is our culture and, and, and put it on paper, let's ask people who actually work here. You, know, you tell us, what is our culture? I think you have to know your strengths in order to own your outcome. The other part of that is owning your failures and successes. You know, a lot of times, if we look at failures like, oh, that just didn't work, let's forget about that, let's move on. One of the things we do in sport is we want to identify, well, why did that work? You know, what was our process of development and progression, and why did it turn in a different direction? So I think it's important to look at, you know, is it your communication style? Are you really effectively listening? Are you managing the way you think you are? And if not, are you receiving feedback for that? So I encourage you to do a recycle. You know, get a 360 evaluation to figure out how folks really are experiencing U.S. principles or as leaders. But also with your successes. You'll have a lot of successes. Your things go really well. Maybe you do sell those 300 cars in that month and things are, things are great. And if they are, what did you do to get there? Did you follow a process of development that actually was successful? Was there clear DAC? Did you clearly communicate, get everyone aligned with your vision? So there's great commitment. Everyone's now internally motivated. Hey, let's do that again next month. Let's go for, let's go for 400 next month. Well, instead of selling the $30,000 car, let's really target the $90,000 car. And if that vision is clear, you'll have that alignment and commitment. But it's all part of your recycling. You know, so are you evaluating your successes and your failures? Um, my final Olympics was in 2008. And after the line for my trajectory to get there um, was very long and circuitous after i lost that weight uh, the beginning of my junior year in college i went on to win ncaa championships twice in my senior year after having not even qualified at all in those first two years and those results in college helped me to be able to have that professional track career um, the furthest I've ever jumped, just in case you're wondering, is 22 feet 8 inches. And real quickly, because Ross, your foot is about to start at that wall. So Ross's foot is about 12. He's, he'll count off 22 in a little bit. You might reach into this. 22. So with the inches, probably about right here to the wall. Trust me, I can't do that now. So don't ask me to show you, because I am not able. Um, but I really only wanted to compete in the Olympic Games one time. And even just him measuring that out to me, it looks ridiculous. Like, I don't even understand how that happened. And sometimes I think, well, maybe they didn't measure it right, because that does not seem possible. But trust me, people jump further than that. So it's definitely possible. By the time I reached my fifth Olympics, my final one, I was a seasoned professional and I knew what to expect and I had high expectations for myself because even though I was 37, I was extremely fit. I was having great results. I had not been injured. So my fitness level had stayed, had maintained. Um, I could lift as much weight as I, in fact, more than I did when I was 22 or 27. So I had high expectations for myself Unfortunately, that saying that my dad used to tell me, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, uh, that happened in, in Beijing. And I got sick. I got some kind of virus or something. I still don't know what it was, but just picture frosted flakes on my face. And that's what I looked like four days before my long jump qualifying round. So I couldn't eat, I could barely drink for the four days leading up to my competition. And when you're trying to compete against the best athletes in the world, that is not the way to prepare. So suffice to say, my performance was horrible. All I could think about was getting off the field because I looked terrible, I felt terrible, I had lost a bunch of weight. 
and in my mind I was just like really like this is not how I planned this thing to go or how I planned to go out um, it was my worst result of all the Olympics I had competed in and all I could do was like gather myself go through the media line I had to stop I competed for the Bahamas and the media people were standing there and you have to speak to them and it was live on the radio in the Bahamas and first thing the guy said to me was like, Jackie Edwards, what happened? Why does your face look so terrible? <laughs> I just burst into tears. And <laughs> I had to answer the questions and then drag myself off to the warm-up track. By the time I got over there, there was no one left. Literally every person had left the warm-up track except my college coach, Brooks Johnson, who was not a part of the Bahamas team. He was a coach on the US team, but he knew that I would just be about to, you know, inconsolable. So he waited, he was the only person standing there. And he just like welcomed me and he was obviously the last person I would expect to see. And instead of kicking me when I was really, really, really at my lowest point, he gave me this great speech about how the sum of who I was as a person could never be measured in feet and inches. And for a person that spent her whole life measuring everything in feet and inches, that meant a lot to me specifically. Um, he told me that my successes throughout my career could never be outdone by this one performance and that I needed to be able to look at the bigger picture of all that I had accomplished. And he told me to stand up tall and walk out of that stadium with my, head, with my head up high and my shoulders back and to have some self-respect. And honestly, had he not been there in that moment, I'd probably still be laid out in Beijing <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how to stand up. Um, and you know what? He was right. Life is always going to be filled with all this ups and downs and it sounds so you know people say this stuff all the time but it's true and if you're only going to judge yourself by your greatest high or your lowest low that's really not actually an accurate portrayal of what your life and career has actually been um, he asked me if I had given everything I had and I said yes he asked me if I had always played fair and I said yes and he asked me if I had made my family and friends proud and I said yes and he said that's it that's all the answers you need turn around and we walked out of that stadium in Beijing and I never looked back at the bird's nest I, I don't remember what it looks like because I kept walking straight out the stadium um, and one of the things that I always keep with me is something that he said all the time is that knowing what got you there is the thing that's going to keep you there I've said before how long my track career was, which is not the average length of a career, it's much shorter. And I would always think like, why is he always saying that? The reason he would say that to me is because a lot of times when people struggle, they get to the top, they put in all this hard work and then they relax as if now there's no more work to be done. And that is exactly the time when you have to step up and put in even more work to maintain because everybody's coming for you at that point. Um, that heavy foot is the thing that got you there. So you have to keep pressing down and keep pressing forward. And even though it might seem difficult to do that and it's far more easy to relax, um, you have to be willing to put that hard work in if you indeed want to stay there. That's it. Thank you guys for staying with us a little bit longer. Uh, if you do have any questions or other comments, we're happy to take them. Honestly, the thing that I find I found for myself and a lot of athletes will tell you is the training. Because you see these successes and, and pass these milestones in training that generally dictate what you're capable of, it gives you motivation because you're like, well, for instance, 
you set out a plan, you have to increase your strength by X amount of pounds, I need to be able to power clean this amount, I need to be able to squat this amount of weight. So then, if I'm starting out at squatting 300 pounds and my coach says, if you can get to 350 pounds, this lady that jumps such and such, she squats that and that's one of the components. So then I check that off, okay, I'm at 350. By the next Olympics, I'm squatting 375. By the next Olympics, I'm at 405. So I keep getting better. So in my mind, when I could keep improving in training, I always felt that there was more for me that I could always, on any given day. And you would see it, and so just so you know, as a professional athlete, you don't only compete at the Olympics. You compete in Europe on the track circuit, so you compete against these people all the time. You know them, they know you, you're friends some of the times, not friends some of the time. Um, but some days you beat them, some days they beat you. The great thing about the Olympics and why it's so special is you get this one day. On the circuit, you know, I may lose tomorrow, but I come back and beat you the next day. Okay, cool, nobody knows, but I did. The Olympics compels you to be great on that day, in that moment, there's no do-over, and you have to either stand up or stand back and be okay with whatever you put out there. And that excitement and possibility for what I could be was always <coughs> there until the day I stopped. seen me at some meet and I was not interested and <laughs> at the time I had other interests I was not interested in dating <laughs> uh, I, and I personally don't remember meeting Ross at that time <laughs> uh, well, we did she had a good friend on the team who I knew and I asked her like hey who's that over there and she said I don't even waste your time she's not into it don't worry about it so I, I never approached her. So I don't, as far as I know, I met Ross in 2005. Um, and he was a sports psychologist for the USA Track and Field World Championship team. So he was just a person that was there with the team. And that's how I met him. And then we kept seeing each other at World Championships, Olympics. It was always in other countries. So I met him in Helsinki. Then I saw him again in Osaka, Japan. Then I saw him in Beijing. Then I saw him, it was like always some other place and then it wasn't till we were back in the United States and had a couple lunches. Well thank you Ross and Jackie. Your personal stories and guidance on how to tackle adversity and own the outcome are truly inspirational. We'd also like to thank our friends at Integrated Claims Management for sponsoring Ross and Jackie this morning. So we do have two drawings, but before the drawings, we've got some announcements. I think we're going to do the announcements, then we're going to do two drawings. So uh, if you have children,